Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Midway through the work of St. Anselm's Prosologion, we find the argument taking a interesting, indeed, even paradoxical turn. Because Anselm had set out to find a single argument that would not only prove that God existed, but that God was the sole good, all other goods requiring that good, and all the other things that we believe about God. And it seemed like he was making good on that in the early parts of the work up until chapter 14, because in chapter 14, which is actually titled How and Why God is Both Seen and Not Seen by Those Who Seek Him, Anselm confesses to himself and to his interlocutor God in this and to us, the readers, that although he has found the God that he's looking for, he doesn't perceive God. There's a sort of lack or a privation in his way of grasping God. He has understood God via argumentation, reasoning, using the highest part of ourself, the rational mind about God. And he believes that, that what he has reasoned about does exist and has the qualities but he's not having a, you might say, completely comprehensive grasp of the divine substance. So he expresses this by saying that he has seen the light and the truth, but he has not seen God as God. What has he seen? He's seen that God is the highest of all beings, than which nothing better can be thought. He is life itself, light, wisdom, goodness, eternal happiness, happy eternity exists always and everywhere. That's a lot of stuff. But he says, if you have not found your God, how is he the one who you have found? But if you have found him, why do you not perceive him? Why are you not grasping the totality that is God? So he puzzles here and he says, has it not found him whom it it found to be light and truth. And these are two ways of naming, you could say, or conceptualizing God. Looks, uh, light, which Anselm was already using for God in the monologian. And truth, veritas, right? Which is going to show up in a later dialogue, specifically on truth, where God is the sort of capital T truth from which all other truths uh, depend and in, in, in which all other truths are. So he says, how could you have understood anything at all uh, about you, that is God, except by your light and truth? Therefore, if it has seen the light and the truth, it has seen you. But notice that light and truth here are sort of stand-ins for God. As, as good as they are, as wonderful as they are, as, as supreme and superlative, as they are, and as much of an important role as they play in, you could say, visual perception and analogously in the perception through the eye of the mind or the soul, they're not everything that God is. They're not giving us God as God. So, again, using this visual metaphor, Anselm talks about his soul as trying to conceptualize what lies beyond what it has seen, what lies beyond what it has conceptualized, what it has grasped. And he says that this is darkness. Now, does that mean that insofar as we cannot grasp God, whatever it is that we grasp is non-existent or false or 
untrue or however you want to put it, existing in darkness, a kind of privation? Or are we looking at this the wrong way? Why is there darkness? Well, there could be two reasons why something is dark. It could be that if we want to use again this visual metaphor, it could be that we're looking at something and we don't see what's there. Why? Because our eyes are too weak. Because in this case, Anselm's mind is darkened as he began this by this entire work by saying that his mind had been darkened by the vices and many sins. So it's darkened in itself. But even if, and Anselm is actually quite a good guy, even if we're talking about somebody who is a saint, who is perfectly good, if we can imagine such a thing. And even the saints aren't, aren't said to be perfectly good, quite frankly, if you, if you check out Lives of the Saints. They could still be dazzled. Their eyes of the mind could still be uh, overwhelmed by the, super, the superlative or supreme uh, illumination coming from the divine light. So it could be weakness on the side of the perceiver, and it could be that what is being perceived is just too much for that perception. Anselm takes both of these to be the case. So he says, you know, um, is, is my eye darkened by its own infirmity or is it dazzled by its splendor? Surely it's both darkened in itself and dazzled by you. It is obscured by its own littleness and overwhelmed by your vastness. So it's not simply visual. It's also, you could say, quantitative in a certain sense. Or perhaps we could talk about degrees of being. It is pinched by its own narrowness and vanished, uh, vanquished by your fullness. So he says, how great is that light? For from it flashes every truth that enlightens the rational mind. And this is as much as we get of the sort of illumination theory that Augustinians in the Middle Ages made so much of. Anselm does think that God is the light that illuminates every single rational mind, not only our own mind, but every other one. And when we try to conceive of what that would be like, we come to a kind of, you know, aporia or, or halt. We're not able to fully conceptualize that. And he'll go on in chapter 15 and reframe this in terms of the argument. If you recall, the unum argumentum, the single argument, took off to prove that God exists and God is all these other things as well, the divine attributes, by saying that God was Comaius cogitari non posit. That is, God is that than which a greater cannot be conceived or thought, however you want to translate cogitari. Here, Anselm says, God not only is that, God not only is that than which a greater cannot be thought, God is also something greater than what can be thought. So that, that sounds a little strange. Let's run through that one more time. God not only is what Anselm had said he was earlier, that than which nothing greater can be thought. So anything you can think of, God is greater than that. But God is also, in a certain sense, beyond even that, God is greater than the, <laughs> what can be thought, right? Uh, so... God surpasses our capacities to think. Now notice something very interesting here though. Anselm is reaching this through thought. So there is something about human thinking that again, paradoxically allows us to surpass human thinking and even to think about what exceeds human thought. So, Quidem maius quam cogitari poset is another way of understanding what God is. Anselm even provides a bit of argumentation here. He says that since it's possible to think that such a being, namely a being greater than can be thought, exists, then if you are not that being, it's possible to think of something greater than you, but that is impossible. So the very same logic 
by which Anselm argued for the existence of God, for the you know, greatness of God in so many other ways, justice, you know, eternity, truth, all these other divine attributes, he now is using to argue that God is something that is greater any, than anything we can even think of. He is beyond our thinking. In chapter 16, now he brings this to a close. So he began with a kind of visual metaphor, talking about our human capacities, came back into the argument, and now he's going to bring in a trope which has been used long before him by other religious thinkers, talking about God as dwelling in an inaccessible light. What would that mean? For God to dwell in an inaccessible light. Well, God himself or itself is that light. So that would be part of it. God dwells within the divinity, whatever that happens to be. And we're able to penetrate into it to a certain degree. Uh, we can do so through all sorts of modes, including using the rational human mind and argumentation. So he says, surely there is no other being that can penetrate this light so that it might see you there. The reason I do not see it is it is too much for me. And again, Anselm brings up these ways in which the human mind falls short. He talks about himself as being dazzled by the splendor of this light of the God that he's trying to conceive of being overwhelmed by vastness being perplexed by extent. And then this is one that I thought I took, wanted to take a little bit out of order uh, from how Anselm himself arranges these rhetorically. Vanquished by fullness. There is a surplus, you could say, beyond surpluses that makes it impossible for the human being to fully or even you might say, I mean, what, what percentage should we establish? Whatever percentage we, we pick, it's going to be something lower than that. Uh, we're not able to take in the surplus that is the divine. So whatever conceptualization that we're able to formulate of it, and Anselm is formulating quite a coherent and rich conception in the Proslogion, that by itself is still inadequate to what God is. And that is why we can use this metaphor of dwelling in inaccessible light. We could frame the same thing in different ways. And that is what he does in these three chapters of the, the Proslogion.